Hello everyone, what is up? It is me, Ewan, from What Culture Comics, joined as ever by the infinitely yawny person, Zoe Miskelly. I got a lot of yawns. Because it's a big, big comics week this week. If actually, you know, you'll notice that this is a Wednesday, we usually do this stuff on a Thursday, and it's because I'm not here tomorrow, and I actually went into the comic book shop this morning to pick up Doomsday Clock number 12, and as we all predicted, it is a bit of a doozy. There is so much going on in this issue. We have thoughts. Uh, Zoe is more positive on it than I am. Um, I think thought I'm a little bit disappointed right now I think it's probably because I've been spoiled by the Watchmen TV show we'll kind of get into more details now so if you haven't read the issue or you just don't you, you, you don't mind being well you don't want to be spoiled just just go away go away right now uh, but if you do want to be spoiled you want to learn every all the juicy little bits of info and now kind of own personal thoughts on the actual comic itself um, Everyone will know for a long time that obviously, you know, there's big DC Watchmen crossover going on. Dr. Manhattan was revealed to have been manipulating uh, the DC universe, and that's why the new 52 came about, so we could all put our, our, project, our collective ire on Dr. Manhattan, which we all did. And um, basically, that it was all built into a massive confrontation between Superman and Dr. Manhattan, manipulated by Ozymandias, who thought that, you know, if those two had a confrontation, that would be he'd save the world, he'd save everything. And. Even though I was enjoying the series up until this point, there was, an ang there was a little twang of anxiety at the back of my mind, Zoe. And the reason why is because even though I think every issue is going great, I was like, oh wow, we're, we're at issue 10 now, and he hasn't, there's still so much to wrap. Oh, we're at issue 11 now. <laughs> there is still so much to wrap up, and lo and behold, this thing is just one big giant. If you thought the Lord of the Rings Return of the King's ending was like long and, and overwrought, like this really goes off in one. I will kind of prefix all my thoughts by saying that I know stuff reads better in trade. I know that when I sit down and read all this in one big go, it's probably going to come form together in my mind a little bit better than it has done already. I would say the biggest issue with this issue has been, thank you, uh, has been just the amount of time we've had between it. Like, mm -hmm. I think it was always going to be something that everyone would struggle to get back into because unless you literally go through and read all the other 11 issues, it's going to feel weird. And even then, it's still going to feel weird because so much has happened. In as you said, the entire Watchmen series managed to happen in the space yes. of time we had like for the delay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, spacing is definitely, it's a... Uh, it's biggest sin right now, at least yeah. for me. I, I mean, know you have. At the same time, it's also I'm kind of, I have to admire them for actually sticking with the same creative team because I think Doomsday Clock, you know, it is such a Jeff Johns, Gary Frank book. It needs to be them too, and Brad Anderson, of course, uh, all of them coming together to finish this. I'm very glad that we've actually had such a big premium comic release, and there have been no changes in the creative team. And you know, props to to, to Johns and, and, and Frank for sticking to their guns in that issue. Yeah, the main kind of basically, if you read the last issue, you know that this uh, that, that that issue ended with Superman and Manhattan, you know, staring each other down. You think everything's going to come to come to a you know, fiery conclusion, and you know Superman gets attacked by uh, Black Adam's forces and also the Russian forces at the same time. And all the meanwhile, Manhattan's just there, you know, chilling with his with his wang out, just being like, eh. and Superman's like, "Save me, Manhattan!" <laughs> Manhattan's all like, "No." <laughs> like that, and that happens for about a good few issue, uh, pages, and then the actually, you know, Superman does appeal to his compassion. He appeals to his. Um, his romance with Janie, who obviously, you know, he goes into the whole thing to pick up the watch, and that's how that's how John Osterman became Dr. Manhattan, and he appeals to his sense of compassion there. And then basically, with that in mind, he decides to remake the entire universe. Now, this <laughs> is basically what I'm going to call DC's new timeline, because he goes in and basically changes everything, and then it gets a little bit meta towards the end, doesn't it, Zoe? It gets pretty hardcore. I really like this bit. Mm -hmm. I know you have mixed feelings on it, but there's uh, a lot of interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. It's sort of almost like a a sweet self-referential sort of like, ah, we do change our timeline a lot, don't mm. we, boys? Yeah. There's a little Marvel reference, which there a lot is. of people have picked so up on. So I'll go through the timeline right now. So basically what happens is, obviously the thing that causes the new 52 in Doomsday Clock is revealed to be the fact that Manhattan moved um, Alan Scott's, um, I forget, the lantern out of reach, and that effectively kills him from a train collision, and that stops the Justice Society of America forming, and all that. So immediately the first thing that Manhattan does is he brings Alan Scott, uh, his, his, his lantern back, the Justice Society of America, America forms, they continued to be a World War II era team, uh, and you know they had Wonder Woman serving with them as well, and then that inspires uh, Superman to become Superboy. He then saves his parents, and that's why you know you, you have the whole thing going on, so that's one of the big changes at the same time. Uh, at the same time, I could completely get in this wrong, this could all be a continuity <laughs> that doesn't even exist anymore. But we'll kind of go through it all right now. So as they're confronting 
all the uh, Black Adam's forces. Um, we get through to Manhattan basically feeling as though he's inspired. We get to Earth 2, the very first multiverse kind of fragments. Uh, we get the first Crisis, and that Earth becomes Earth 1985, which is obviously when Crisis on Infinite Earths was published. Um, we get this whole thing again reiterating that, you know, every single DC multiverse is built around Superman, which I think is a little bit kind of... It's a bit much, maybe. It is a little bit overly sentimental, I want to say. What do you think? Uh, it's overly sentimental, but also the thing is, it's not wrong. No. But then I would say it's more built around Batman, but you don't really no. want to directly That's a little bit, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then we keep on going forward. We get to uh, the year 2020, and we get a new... Basically, this is where we look into the future. And I don't know if this is whether... This is the interesting thing for me, Zoe, because obviously Jeff Johns isn't as hands-on with the DC universe as he was when Doomsday Clock commence. You know, he's, there's a big kind of uh, kerfuffle over his role with the DC films and what he's doing in the future. Obviously, we've got three Jokers coming out as well. Um, but this kind of talks about looking into the DC universe going forward. So we get the year is 2020. Superman's timeline is bombarded by the reckless energies of the old gods once again warping the metaverse. It's July 2nd, 2025. And a new crisis comes along. And it's called Time Masters. There's all sorts of different things going on right now. Teases for what could be a potential event, I don't know, or events that have been lost in the future retcons. It's all... Pretty exciting because we also get a reference to Marvel, don't we? A little, a little uh, green Goliath or behemoth. Behemoth, I think it yes. Is. yes. So behemoth. it mentions in, on July tenth, twenty thirty, the secret crisis begins, throwing Superman into a brawl across the universe with Thor himself and a green behemoth stronger than even Doomsday, who dies protecting Superman from these invaders. In its wake, Superman's timeline shifts forward again, and basically what happens now is it kind of confirms that the DC universe timeline is in a constant loop. And as someone who really just wishes that these timelines would just progress. And get development is kind of just like oh inevitably consigning ourselves to the future where in 30 years time we will have superman's origin again and it'll all be the same thing over and over and over and it was over a mixed one for me over. because like I, I do think there have been efforts in the past or at least in recent past mm -hmm. to try and make a consistent dc timeline and did you feel like this was more sort of jeff throwing in a nice little jab being like yeah yeah that was us we've yeah. done it a lot yeah. superman is continuously reborn batman's parents die every other year like it's a thing that we do quite a lot and we should probably should probably get to that yes i completely agree it's one of those things where like i just i was looking forward to it and doomsday clock was like i was like finally they're gonna address why so many people i mean i know people like the new 52 and myself i wasn't so keen on it I mean, they're gonna address why you know dc rebirth was necessary and why you know dc kind of lost a little bit of its magic going through um the new 52 that actually does get its own earth designation here that is now earth 52 in this comic um but at the same time i'm just kind of like i would have liked something more substantial and like it's it's weird to me that it's all getting glossed over just it's all coming right now and i still don't really know if dc are going to follow through with everything here obviously it does link back to the legion of superheroes just something to keep an eye on as well that issue the, the second issue released today but i don't know Zoe, how do you feel about all the retcons so for me it's a mixed thing i think perhaps the issue is that we went into this comic thinking it was mostly going to be about timelines mm. because that is very much the perspective you get from looking at a lot of it but i think when you look at the ending especially i think it's in retrospect supposed to be a lot more about sort of the human element of superheroes yes um, i do think essentially if you shortened the comic down to sort of a blurb it would be dr manhattan learns to care <laughs> like that's that's basically <laughs> yes. it and i i love that it was also something i love from the watchman show mm -hmm. um but at the same time yeah i can understand why people like you are upset about it because mm. I wanted to see all the cool things and have stuff explained and sort of surprises thrown yeah. at me. Instead, I got a small child. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I do like that. There's obviously the, the biggest reveal now is that um, basically the whole marionette and mime, who I feel went missing from this series <laughs> like ages ago, they come back and they reveal you know, the whole thing with their child and you know how kind of uh, Manhattan takes it. And, and the whole thing is that he's inspired by Superman to basically re rebuild the Watchmen universe and kind of take it and, and usher a new era in. And they basically get a new child and they give it to the Drybergs, I believe. And um, the, you know they ask who his name is and he turns around and he's got the big kind of... Um, you know, circle in his head, and it's a. He says Clark. Yep. So we learn that they've basically inherited, you know, Doctor Manhattan's thing. Which they've is... got a weird Superman Doctor Manhattan hybrid baby. And yes. I, as much as I don't want them to go too much into just the Watchmen universe, mm. I am like, what are we? Are we going to do anything with yeah, that boy? I really hope not. Again, I, I feel so small by the TV show in the sense. You know, I think there was a thing that the TV show did much better, and that was social commentary. And there is some really, well, I'm going to say, very surface level social commentary it's on the here nose. that basically boils down to, oh, why can't people? People start fight, stop fighting and talk to each other, which is just so lazy and so ham-fisted given that Johns throughout the entire series has been actually delving into some really nuanced social commentary and subtext. And I felt as though just ending it all on just, why can't people just talk to each other? Rally around Superman.
man who can inspire everyone to do that, ignoring all the kind of the nuances behind why, you know, society is so divided at this current moment in time. And maybe I was expecting too much from a superhero comic to actually, you know, go in, but I do feel as though, given what he dealt with beforehand, I wanted to see more conclusion and resolution from in, in that aspect rather than just some surface level, why can't we be friends? <laughs> it's interesting because like I, I'm sort of in two minds about this. On mm. one hand, I think it was very interesting the dialogue between Superman and Dr. Manhattan that mm -hmm. ultimately gets them to not fight because, yeah, obviously the one thing that Superman would be capable of to defeat Dr. Manhattan is being like, look, I'm not gonna fight you. Mm -hmm. Like, I have no reason to fight you. I think it's very much a commentary on like, the whole time you're like, they're definitely gonna fight. The mm -hmm. only way that is that like this thing could end is if they fight, but they were never gonna fight. I mean, but also, yeah. on another hand, God damn it, I wanted them to fight. Please give me a fight. I did love that moment though. I think my favorite moment in the comic, to be fair, is that moment where you think Superman's gearing up to punch him after Manhattan's basically said, hey, everything that's crappy about your life, that was me. And then <laughs> Superman just goes and like punches a guy who was about to attack Manhattan. And you know, I think that was a good turning point in it. And I definitely did like that. As someone who loves Superman, it's nice to see, you know, even though I did just criticize the whole sentimental aspect of it all, I do like seeing him uniting you know, the dude. Yeah. Being the dude, and if anyone can turn cold hard John Osterman into, you know, a, a compassionate man, he probably is the man of steel. Um, but yeah, please let us know what you thought of Doomsday Clock number 12 down in the comments below. Were you sold on the series, or were you not a fan? Once you've done that, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and head back on over to whatculture.com forward slash comics. You can find more news, lists, and articles like this every day. You can follow me on Twitter at Yoon Things. You can follow Zoe on Twitter at Zemiscale. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.